What you're seeing here is a 75-year-old Henry Ford receiving the Grand Cross of the Supreme Order of the German Eagle on his 75th birthday on January 30th, 1938. This honor was created by Adolf Hitler himself in 1937, and Henry Ford was the only American to ever receive it. And after that, one Nazi document shows that nine months later, in April 1939, for Hitler's birthday, and every year after that, Henry Ford gave him, Hitler, 35,000 Reichmarks as a birthday present, which was the equivalent of about $14,000 in, in those days, which today is worth roughly $300,000 every single year. That's right, they were besties and had been for many years and would be for several years to come. I won't say many. And they weren't just friends. Henry Ford was without a doubt one of the greatest influences on Adolf Hitler's life. And Hitler himself said in one interview for a Detroit newspaper in 1931, I regard Henry Ford as my inspiration. In this video, we're going to start off by following the lives of these two men as they grew up on different sides of the world, essentially developing the same belief systems in different ways, and then finally converging to become allies and friends who gave each other birthday presents. Now, before we continue, I want to say that what we're going to be talking about today, some of these things are really, really bad in this video. They're going to be very offensive and very, very sensitive information. So I'll just start out by saying Hitler was evil, and so is anti-Semitism on every single level. I'm making this video because it honestly baffles me how a man who has become a symbol in so many ways of America was an open antagonist and, and enemy of the people that America has stood by since our founding, and was also a close personal friend of perhaps the most evil person in modern history. Yet, somehow, that part of history has been almost entirely forgotten and in many ways erased by the very rich and powerful people out there with limitless pockets. I don't agree with and I stand against everything that Henry Ford and Hitler stood for in those times. Okay, let's move on. Let's just jump right in and talk about Henry Ford essentially created Adolf Hitler in many ways. Nobody seems to be able to pinpoint exactly why Henry Ford hated the Jews so much. Growing up in rural Michigan in the late 1800s, it may seem strange that he would have even been exposed to anti-Semitic people. However, it's, it's really important for us to go back a little bit and take note that when the Civil War broke out in 1861, racism was really at its peak in America, which is not surprising, but it wasn't just toward black people. It was also toward the Jews as well. As a matter of fact, it was so bad that General Ulysses S. Grant issued General Order No. 11, which exiled all Jews from every part of Tennessee, Kentucky, and Mississippi that were under his control within 24 hours. In a later order, Grant said that no Jews are to be permitted to travel on the road southward, and his aide, Colonel John Du Bois, ordered that all cotton speculators, Jews, and all vagabonds with no honest means of support were to leave the district, and he said the Israelites especially should be kept out, they are such an intolerable nuisance. Horrible words, that's what they said. Abraham Lincoln blocked these orders, and when Grant ran for president later, he apologized and changed his attitude, becoming friendly towards the Jews. But like most politicians, we can probably assume he wasn't exactly acting from the heart. Henry Ford would have been very well aware of this, as well as the constant stream of Jews that were immigrating to America all throughout his childhood and adult life. Between 1881 and 1924, nearly 5 million Jews immigrated to America, most of them coming from intense poverty. The immigration was so intense that from 1881 to 1924, the Jewish population grew in America from 1% of the population to 3.5%. That's a huge spike. At first, these Jewish people mostly worked in the mines and factories, but they were incredibly business savvy and smart and quickly began opening much bigger and more profitable businesses. And in particular for the story of Henry Ford, they opened and controlled many banks by the time Henry Ford began the Henry Ford Company in 1901. 
later known as the Ford Motor Company. These Jewish bankers, for the most part, focused specifically on investment banks, which were the kind of banks someone like Henry Ford would have had to deal with. So by the 1890s, people began to accuse the Jews of controlling all the world's finances. And this idea was especially embraced by the business owners who wanted to borrow money, but found that they would have to do so from primarily Jewish investment bankers. This image here is from a magazine called Sound Money from an 1886 issue. This image is called this is the U.S. in the hands of the Jews. A lot of people began accusing the Jews also of attempting to fix the U.S. dollar and force the entire nation's economy into a single gold standard. The result of all of these conspiracy theories was that rich, influential people like Henry Ford and many others began making every effort to block Jewish people from entering into other areas of business. Many of these big companies they secretly created quotas to restrict the amount of Jewish employees to 10% or less in order to keep them under control. And not so fun fact, Henry Ford's conspiracy theories knew no limits. He even went to the extreme of putting his weight into popularizing square dancing because he believed that Jews invented jazz as a plot to corrupt society. He saw square dancing as the true American white person dance. He saw square dancing as the true white American dance. And he was so powerful that he got square dancing established as a required part of physical education in public schools in 1928. Now that we've looked at Ford, let's move over to Adolf Hitler's life. Now, Hitler was growing up in Austria during all of these things happening in the United States until he moved to Germany in 1913. He fought for the German Empire during World War I and couldn't understand how the Germans had lost that war. As a soldier, he believed that it was impossible for their armies to have been defeated on the field. Most German soldiers felt the same way, so a story began to spread through the ranks that they hadn't been defeated on the field at all. It was the Jews and the communists that had betrayed them and stabbed them in the back and it was that betrayal that caused them to lose the war. Hitler bought into that story all the way to the hilt. And while anti-Semitism was as old as memory, for Hitler, this became the seed of what was to come. Eventually, Hitler blamed the Jews for everything and believed that they were at the root of all of Germany's problems. And because Germany was still economically in ruins, he believed that the only way to restore his nation to its former glory was to remove all the Jews. Now, I do have to take a second here to acknowledge there are a lot of other theories as to why Hitler hated the Jews so much, but none of them really have that much evidence behind them. There's everything from him being ashamed of his partly Jewish roots to getting an STD from a Jewish prostitute and so much more. In my personal opinion, the one that has the most evidence and makes the most sense is this belief that the Jews were to blame for losing the war. Although, there are certainly other things that for sure contributed to this belief, as we'll see with Henry Ford in just a few moments here. After World War I, Hitler joined the German Workers' Party, which would eventually become the Nazi Party, and this is where the Hitler-Ford bromance first began. When Hitler joined the German Workers' Party, he actually thought that it was sloppy and disorganized, but the founder Anton Drexler stood for just about everything that Hitler did and specifically really bought into those conspiracy theories about the Jews. At the same time that this was happening in Germany, Henry Ford started to become more open about his anti-Semitic views. In 1919, Ford was on a camping trip with some of his friends, and he went out on this tangent about the Jews. And one of those friends who happened to be there wrote in his journal that Ford said that he attributes all evil to Jews or to the Jewish capitalists. The Jews caused the war. The Jews caused the outbreak of thieving and robbery all over the country. The Jews caused the inefficiency of the Navy. These are the things that, that uh, Ford said at the camping trip. A little before this, Ford had purchased a local newspaper called the Dearborn Independent. In this newspaper, he published a 91-part series called The International Jew. This was essentially literal volumes of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories largely written by Ford himself. With his vast wealth, he was able to take that publication from a small local newspaper 
to a newspaper with a circulation reaching 900,000 homes, which made it one of the largest publications in America at that time. So take a moment to think about that. Henry Ford wasn't just anti-Semitic. He was directly responsible for spreading anti-Semitic hate to millions of people. And because he was Henry Ford, the men, women, and children in those 900,000 homes would have spread what he wrote to other people. Now, one particular article eventually came out that claimed that the Jewish control over New York banks was financially holding Texas cotton farmers hostage. For this, Ford was sued for libel, and Henry Ford did the same thing he always did when he got into trouble for the things that he did, as we'll see here in a few minutes. He claimed that he had no idea what was going on in the newspaper, and he blamed everyone else. But it was pretty easily proven through witnesses that Ford personally approved of every single issue of the International Jew, especially because that newspaper was his personal passion project. Henry Ford, caught red-handed, issued a public apology and claimed that he was shocked by the content. And yet, the same shocked Mr. Ford in 1920 allowed the International Jew to be compiled into a four-volume anthology and translated into 16 languages and distributed globally. Now, Henry Ford was not only responsible for spreading anti-Semitism in America, but all over the planet. There was one particular group of people in Germany that got a hold of this anthology, freshly translated into their native tongue, who were superfans. That's right, the German Workers' Party. They took the international Jew and it became like their own personal Bible. It was so beloved, in fact, that Adolf Hitler himself kept copies of the anthology in his office in Munich, as well as a giant portrait of Henry Ford on his wall. There were also several other Nazis who were on the fence before, who became anti-Semitic after reading the anthology. One Nazi leader, Balder Benedict von Schirach, said, I read it and became anti-Semitic. In those days, this book made such a deep impression on my friends and myself because we saw in Henry Ford the representative of success, also the exponent of progressive social policy. In the poverty-stricken and wretched Germany of the time, youth looked toward America. And apart from the great benefactor Herbert Hoover, it was Henry Ford who represented to us America. After reading Ford's anthologies, Balder went on to personally become responsible for sending 65,000 Jews to concentration camps. That was a direct result of Ford's writings. Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf that Henry Ford is a single great man and that Ford was his inspiration. Hitler grew in power over the next couple of years and somewhere in there, Hitler and Ford connected. It isn't exactly known when they met in person, but Ford was all on board with the Nazi movement. And as Ford was competing with other automakers for a share in the German automotive business, he was there throughout the 1920s and 30s, and it's likely that he met Hitler, or at least had some kind of communication with him at the very start of the 1920s. The reason why is because in 1922, the New York Times reported that Henry Ford was funding Adolf Hitler's fledgling Nazi movement. Emboldened by his hero Henry Ford financially backing his Nazi party, Hitler attempted his failed coup in 1923. Although this failed, this didn't deter Hitler or Henry Ford from pushing the Nazi party forward. And as Hitler gained more and more power over the following years in political and military might, Henry Ford's power also grew in Germany and he established several factories there. Hitler once said that it was his desire to help Heinrich, Henry Ford, become the leader of the growing fascist movement in America. In 1934, when Hitler became the head of state and overall evil overlord of Germany, Henry Ford was solidly right behind him, building vehicles and supporting the Nazi hateful cause in any way he possibly could. As I said at the beginning of this video, Henry Ford received the Grand Cross of the Supreme Order of the German Eagle on his 75th birthday on July 30th, 1938. Again, one captured Nazi document shows that nine months later in 1939 for Hitler's birthday, Henry Ford gave Hitler roughly $300,000. Now, he did that every year for a birthday present for Hitler, and if that was just a birthday present, Imagine how much Ford must have been funding the Nazis. And in 1940, 
Ford published a poem in his newspaper called Führer, obviously to his bromance partner, Hitler. And it goes like this. We have sworn to you once, but now we make our allegiance permanent. Like currents in a torrent lost, we all flow into you. Even when we cannot understand you, we will go with you. One day we may comprehend how you can see our future. Hearts like bronze shields we have placed around you. And it seems to us that only you can reveal God's word to us. World War II started on September 1st, 1931. And even as the darker and darker and more despicable truths came out about what Hitler was doing, the Ford Motor Company factories continued functioning and producing vehicles. From 1941 to 1944, Ford had produced 33% of the trucks used by the Nazis and about 10,000 half-tracks. In a federal class action suit against Ford that took place in 1997, it was shown that Ford's Cologne factory made about 60% of the German military's three-ton tracked vehicles during the war. The suit says that before the war, the plant made passenger vehicles. In June 1944, when American troops invaded Europe, they found themselves facing Nazi soldiers driving vehicles built by Ford, manufactured in Germany, with the full knowledge and consent of Henry Ford back in the United States. Now, when this news got back to America, the Ford company, of course, released a statement saying that it was a mischaracterization. However, U.S. Army investigator Henry Schneider said in his report on September 5, 1945, that the German branch of Ford served as an arsenal of Nazism, at least for military vehicles, with the consent of the parent company in Dearborn. Henry Ford, of course, did the same thing that he always did, which was to claim that he had no idea what was happening in those factories. He had no control over what they did. Of course, in his innocence, he also personally vetoed U.S. government-approved plans to supply engines and other vehicles to France and the UK, and he had no problem receiving the profits from the sales. And after the war, Ford continued to employ the Nazi factory owners who enslaved and killed the Jewish people. But, you know, he had no idea he was innocent. And when the US military bombed these evil factories, Henry Ford turned around and sued the US government for doing so. He was a real stand-up guy. The 1997 class action suit that I mentioned earlier said that the Nazi government meticulously safeguarded wartime profits for Ford, which were deposited in German banks for delivery to Ford Motor Company at the close of the war. When Ford officials were asked how much money Henry Ford received after the war, the answer was classic Ford. It's unclear how much. Also, these factories were not filled with surly Nazi laborers. They were slaves who had been kidnapped by the Nazis and forced to work in building the Nazi war machine. Ford, of course, said he had no idea. However, one last nail in the coffin was the uncovering of even more Nazi documents that linked Ford to Auschwitz itself. It was even rumored that Hitler designed much of the concentration camps based on Ford's factory setup because he believed it was so efficient. There may not be a document directly stating that, but based on their relationship and how much Hitler idolized Henry Ford, it's pretty easy to connect the dots and see how that could very much be true. Henry Ford and Adolf Hitler were friends until Hitler's cowardly end. But Ford never turned away from his anti-Semitic ways, and he stood by them until he died just a few years later in 1947, not far behind his best buddy and just as evil as ever.